Okay. Are we live? Yep, we're live on YouTube. All right. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, the 1st of March, for the virtual Cranbrook meeting of the Warren Astronomical Society. I am uh, the current president, Diane Hall, and I am going to kick things off with a brief in the news in the sky presentation because we have a lot of stuff to cover tonight as far as our short and long talks go so let me pull up my keynote here bear with me gang i just uploaded i just upgraded my mac to big sur and everything's a little bit funky Yep. All yep. right, here we go. Oh. Sharing. Good. Okay, can y'all see my screen in the news, March 1st, 2021? Okay, Adrian gives me a thumbs up. That means we're good to go. Cool. All right. So, in all of the excitement over the landing of the rover Perseverance and its Mars Copter Buddy Ingenuity, it may have passed unnoticed that the parachute, while the standard orange and red white colors that we expect from a NASA chute, was a bit odd. And it turns out that there was a secret message embedded in the parachute using binary code. So two messages have been um, encoded in the neutral white and international orange. The inner portion spells out D-A-R-M-I-G-H-T-Y-T-H-I-N-G-S, Dare Mighty Things. The outer band provides coordinates, latitude and longitude for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, where the rover was built. So Perseverance system engineer Ian Cook designed the binary code pattern. The saying is JPL's motto. It's an abridgment from a quote from Teddy Roosevelt. Far better it is to dare mighty things to win glorious triumphs, though even though checkered by failure. So that was pretty cute. Uh, Perseverance has a number of Easter eggs, but I was particularly delighted by this one because when the shoot opened, I noticed something was weird, but honestly couldn't tell you what. All right, down in Boca Chica, Texas, SpaceX is trying again with its Starship prototype. SN8 blew up. SN9 flew high and then crash landed in the Gulf Coast. SN10 will try to improve upon that, and it might happen as soon as Wednesday. So this is a shot of SN9 and SN10 together intact on the pad down there in Boca Chica. Uh, Elon Musk, CEO of SpaceX, has promised that these rockets will pr have revolutionary travel to the moon, Mars, and beyond, but uh, given the past two rapid disassembly events, there was a bit of doubt as to whether or not the FAA would be happy to let SpaceX try it again. The crash report on SN9 satisfied the FAA. And so, yeah, maybe Wednesday. We'll see you cross your fingers. Okay, speaking of things that are almost there, February marks significant progress for NASA's latest space telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, completed its final functional performance test in Redondo Beach at Northrop Grumman down in California. Two important milestones that confirmed its internal electronics are functioning as intended and its suite of scientific instruments can send and receive data properly. These move the JWST closer to being ready to launch in October.
So, uh, an infamous asteroid uh, flies by this month. Apophis was touted as a potential planet killer after it was discovered in 2004. As you can see from this simulation from Caltech, it has a funky orbit. Most Earth asteroids kind of orbit us in a nice little belt. Apophis careens in. It's relatively large. It's more than 300 meters wide, height of the Eiffel Tower. And initially, it was calculated that there would be a 3% chance it would collide with Earth on 2029. It won't. More precise observations put that to rest. But the infamous space rug will come visiting next month, give scientists a chance to not only study it, but to do some um, planetary defense dry runs, treating it as though it were a hazard and, um, you know, working out their scenarios for what you do when something comes careening our way. So, sounds like... There? Sorry, I'll look into it. Okay, I think they left the meeting. All right, fireball this weekend. Observers in parts of the UK witnessed a heck of a show when a massive, slow moving fireball made its way across the night sky late on Sunday. You came on the UK Meteor Observation Network. Citizen Science Group that tracks meteor sightings said over 800 eyewitness reports and doorbell and dash cam videos were logged. People reported hearing either a sonic boom or a rumbling noise, and it's believed this meteor may have left debris on the ground. The UK Fireball Alliance, led by Natural History Museum staff, mapped it out and thinks that there may be meteorites scattered around the Cheltenham area. Initial asteroids report it may have come from an asteroid moving about 300,000 miles an hour. Too fast to be an old rocket or a defunct satellite. And last time we covered the news story that the ESA was recruiting a para-astronaut. An astronaut who would not have passed previous generation's physical fitness exams, but might be just the person to send into the final frontier. Well, the U.S. privately is... Ahead of the curve there, by the end of the year, Haley Arsenault will be the youngest American in space, one of the first tourists to enter orbit unaccompanied by professional asteroids, astronauts, and since she is a childhood cancer survivor with steel rods in her left leg, somebody who previously would have been disqualified from becoming an astronaut. Haley, as a child, wanted to be an astronaut, the bone cancer that uh, altered her leg ruined that dream. But in this age of chartered Falcon 9 SpaceX rockets, she's going to go into space along private billionaire Jared Isaacman, who wants to bring space to people that uh, would previously not have been able to go. So if this mission goes off this year, not only will 29-year-old Haley be the youngest American ever in space, she will be behind the youngest person ever to go to space, German Titov, the Soviet cosmonaut who flew Vostok 2 a very long time ago. As far as what's going on in the sky, we've got a few things this month. This is zodiacal light season. If you have never seen zodiacal light, the fascinating cone of a hazy light um it'll be easiest to spot in the two weeks that precede the new moon this month on saturday march 13th after the evening twilight has disappeared you'll have about half an hour to check the western sky for this broad wedge like a shark fin a faint light going up to the horizon centered on the ecliptic mars will act as a good anchor to show you where the ecliptic is so look for a broad hazy triangle of light like a detached piece of the milky way pointing to mars and i believe our astro imagers can verify that the zodiacal light can be extremely annoying when one is trying to image march 4th minor planet vesta the brightest of the main belt astronauts will be visible all night long because vesta will be at opposition it'll shine at its brightest for the year magnitude 5.8 
just within naked eye visibility from a dark sky site about as bright as the planet Uranus and well within the reach of binoculars and small telescopes. Look for it in Leo, one finger width to the left of the bright star, Chertan. It'll be close to Chertan for a number of nights, but the fourth is your best bet. Meanwhile, on Saturday, March 6th, we'll have Mercury at its greatest elongation in the morning. It'll be trailing the sun, 27 degrees, peak visibility. Not so great for those of us up here in the northern, mid-northern latitudes because the ecliptic is not tilted favorably for us. If you are in a southern position, it'll be quite good. Mercury will be hanging out near Jupiter between 5.45 and 6 a.m. in your local time zone. That's the morning of the 6th. And finally, it's that time of year again, March 14th. Those of us in the U.S., be setting your clocks an hour ahead, spring forward into spring. Daylight savings time is back to bite us all. I think you all know how that works by now. So all I can say is I hate it and I'd like Congress to repeal it, but it's here. And enjoy, friends. That is in the news in the sky for right now. One thing, Diane, just as a, a side note, uh, they did hear from Mars for the first time in a while. Yes. With Perseverance and Microsoft. Yeah, there was yeah. a fake audio going around, but there's also real audio now. So your yep. best source for accurate Mars info is NASA and JPL. There is a lot of viral hoaxes, uh, edited photographs and whatnot. So just go to NASA's website and get all the good data. Okay. Thank you very much. And we'll uh, go into the officer's reports now. Again, I'm your president for the year. And I have to report that we have at long last resurrected the dream of doing work at Belle Isle State Park. Got some contacts in with the Audubon Society and local dark sky enthusiasts, including some known to y'all. We It's still very preliminary right now, but um, after the pandemic derailed our attempts to have a WAS event in Belle Isle last year, we are very happy to say that that's been put back on the agenda, and we hope to bring you a Belle Isle Dark Sky event later this year. And with that, I will pass things to Dr. Dale Parton, who thankfully filled in for me when I was indisposed at the McComb meeting. Thank you, Dale, and take it away. Okay, thank you, Diane. Um, <clears throat> at our next meeting, on March 18, our own Bob Tremblay will have the main presentation entitled Basic Orbital Mechanics. That may sound like an arcane, not terribly interesting topic. I guarantee you it will not come across that way. It will be highly entertaining knowing Bob as we do. Uh, then at our meeting about a month from now, on April the 5th, uh, our, our main speaker will be Ann Blackwell, uh, who gave a short presentation to us a few months ago. She will be back by popular demand. Uh, she is a graduate student studying astronomy at the University of Michigan. Uh, she will give the main presentation uh, on April the 5th, entitled Supernova Remnant Kinematics and Cluster Metallicity X-Ray Mysteries. The short presentation that night will be given by David Levy. His presentation is entitled, and it's rather long as you as, as seems to be the case for him. Um, it, his it, the title is of Schmidt cameras, comets, and astro asteroid Bennu, a long friendship with Rick and Dolores Hill. Um, beyond that, uh, I would say I need some speakers going forward. Uh, please, please. Uh, let me know or let any officer know if they know how to get stuff to me. If you have any interest at all in giving a presentation, 
Uh, we can use short presentations of 10 to 15 minutes or full length presentations of around 50 minutes. Uh, so I'm sending the call out. Let me know if you have anything you might consider presenting. Diane, back to you. Thank you, Dale. And I will now pass things to Riyadh, our observatory chair. Thank you, Diane. Hello, everyone. I uh, visited the observatory today. Um, both buildings are in good shape. Everything is dry. No problems at all. Looked at all the equipment. Everything is there. Um, it seems to be good. So, of course, um, our observatory um, is still closed for uh, in person viewing uh, due to COVID. Uh, however, uh, we continue to have our virtual uh, observing through uh, Doug Box uh, Northern Cross Observatory whenever that's possible, when it's clear and Doug is available in the area uh, and he can host that. Uh, attend that if you can when it's available. Um, it's actually a, a very good, very informative, educational. You can ask lots of questions. And uh, Doug is uh, always uh, wonderful in terms of answering all your questions and, and taking uh, requests for what you want to observe. Um, if the object is, is up and available, and maybe not too close to the moon, if it's too dim, <laughs> then it's available for, for us to observe. So um, that's all I have at this time, uh, Diane. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Riyadh. And I'll now pass things to our treasurer, Adrian Bradley. Good evening. I will try and make things short and sweet. Um, first, in the bank, we are sitting at $22,457.49. Um, I have received more mail-in checks um, for membership. Uh, we have currently 159 memberships paid that I've counted for and will be more if you were one of the ones that sent in your uh, renewal or new membership over the last two weeks. So those will get deposited soon as I look to move our account to a an online account to, you know, and make things easier to get things processed. Um, and let's see, I think that's all for my report. That was short and sweet, Adrian. All right, let's pass things to Mark Kidzier, Secretary. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the minutes of the February, uh, both February meetings are in the March edition of the WASP. That's all I have to report. Very thorough minutes of that, Mark. Quite impressive. Thank you. All right. And on to outreach with Bob Tremblay. You know, taking taking my cue from these guys, uh, my outreach report is in the last. And we have uh, last month we had an amazing number of workers uh, doing uh, outreach events. So thanks everyone. Uh, keep it up. Uh, one of the things I outlined uh, in the WASP is that April is coming up and there are several uh, astronomy related events happening in April and I would like to do something then. Uh, I'm thinking for myself doing something like a Kerbal Space Program thing on Yuri's night, uh, which is the 12th. Um, that's up in the air. I, mean, I, I don't have it planned yet, but if anybody would like to do anything during April, um, I'm think I'm also thinking of contacting all the libraries that we've uh, dealt with before to get them to plug uh, astronomy clubs that are you know black members just to you know, get the word out about us. It's just so if you have any any ideas at all about wanting to do something for April, let me know. Contact outreach at warrenastro.org. Thank you, Bob. And then on to Dale Teamy at Publications. Well, thank you, Diane. Um... Just like everyone else, I want to say the WASP is online right now. So that's my report. Also, uh, if anybody's enjoyed the article by Brad Young from the Tulsa Astronomy Club, there's going to be a, a follow up article that's in the works right now uh, for the April issue. So a little something to look forward to. Back to you, Diane. Awesome. OK, we'll segue into subgroups. I do not see Solar Marty, the captain of our solar subgroup, but the sun right now is boring. I will post the link so you can see for yourself. It's boring. We did have a 
group that rotated around last week, but it's gone. So, um, unless somebody has a, something else good to say about the sun, I think we can move on to double stars and history. Double stars, short and sweet, Riyadh. Um, they're still up there. Look for them. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all doing any photo photography at the uh, virtual open houses? <laughs> uh, actually, Doug is uh, is doing a lot of that, um, and uh, he saves the images. Um, and I think they're then he makes them available uh, for people to look at later on as well. So that's that's always there. Good deal, because we have some good double stars coming around for spring. Porima, quite a few nice ones. Yeah. All right, history group with Dale Teamy. Yes. Um... If you've been following along in the WASP, I've been posting pictures that are taken a number of years back as we celebrate our 60 years of the Warren Astronomy Club. And I've been getting a lot of response for uh, identifying <laughs> unknown people. And uh, it's been working out pretty well. So you can look forward to seeing a lot more of that in the near future. Crowdsourcing sounds like fun. Yep. Putting together that historical record. Good deal. Okay, astrophotography. <laughs> Bill Beers, what have you got for us today? Well, I really don't uh, have any specific. Over the weekend, I took a picture of the full snow moon, which was extremely bright from up north. Um, I put it out on Facebook. But um, other than that, I don't have anything. If anybody has any questions about astrophotography, how to get into it or any questions, how to use your camera or whatever, uh, my email is in the WASP under my article. All right, and Doug Buck says he's currently imaging asteroid 15. Um, you know me right now. Cool, cool. Yeah, I've, I've got a, uh, an entry. It's, you'll see it on the WASP, but um, it made its rounds. I managed to catch light pillars up at Alcona, Alcona Park in the- That was awesome. Dam, in the Alcona Dam Pond. Um, yeah, that was really cool. Yeah. And so lately I tried to do some stuff with the snow moon at uh, Lake Huron and one of my favorite uh, places, uh, Port Al Park, right on the thumb. It's basically looking right out at the at Lake Huron. I got some nice pictures, but it didn't do so well at capturing the moon detail and some of the things I wanted to frame. But it's always still fun to be out there and to see the skies as dark as they are. Even in moonlight, I did a 30 second, um, and you'll, you'll appreciate this, Bill and Doug. I went for 30 seconds at about 200 millimeters. Uh, still got, with, with an unmodded camera, moon shining in on Orion, still got the flame, the horse head, the running man, and Orion in that frame. Very faint, but you could see it was there. And it's just, and it's in an unmodded camera. It just, the difference between imaging in dark and not so dark skies just, you know, it's it's almost night and day, which is why I like driving out there. So uh, yeah, there's there's no comparison, uh, Adrian. I've always said to be in dark skies versus having a big telescope. It does make a difference if you can get out. And if you can't get out, of course, that's when all your techniques of imaging and stacking and getting rid of all the noise from the light pollution gets you those uh, results. But if you're able to see, the sky may not look much different to you, but your images are different when you when you uh, image the sky. And it take, takes less exposure time to get data. So it's, uh, you, capture, you capture a lot more. All right. Awesome. We can have a few more observing reports coming up, but uh, first run through GLAC. Bob and Adrian, what have you got for us GLAC wise? I know there's a meeting coming up next week. Well, um, I am trying to remember because I did not prepare anything and I'm the president. But we are, I know our main thing is not only are we looking at what Bob has been talking about doing some sort of kind of pre um, astronomy at the beach event kind of midway through the year. 
um, we are leaning heavily towards making astronomy at the beach a virtual event again. We've talked about hybrid. You know, what it would it take to actually have a couple of scopes out there and still do events so that my good friend David Levy could come on and do a talk without having to travel all the way to Michigan because it would be expensive to fly him in. Um, so we are talking hybrid events um, and we are watching the situation with COVID closely to make sure that if it appears that it will be possible to do a hybrid of it, we will be talking to the state to see, well, how can we make that safe for all of you? Because it's still, you know, we still have that variant from the UK and from, I guess, more or less the UK than South Africa, that's uh, much more contagious. We have to be careful. We cannot be, we cannot be liable because things can still happen um, until we hear otherwise from health outlets and the CDC and the WHO, which of course the United States is now a part of it again. Well, a lot will so, also depend on you know, what the uh, park, what, what their rules are going to be on it. Which is going to follow closely. I mean, that's exactly what happened last year. Um, it followed closely what um, what the state basically said. No, we're you know we're uh, limiting things and. We ended up going virtual. So, so more after our meeting, we'll have we'll have a little more progress. June is kind of the do or die month to have that decided. So, we have given ourselves a little time to watch current events, see how member clubs are doing online, see what the vaccine, see if the vaccination efforts change things faster than we expect. Right now, we don't expect that, but it, you know, we we want to keep open. To it. So, uh, uh, once the time comes, we'll be appealing to all the clubs to support GLAC with you know, whatever event we put on. Um, we did get feedback from our first, excuse me, virtual economy at the beach, and we'll be looking to make some changes. But for the most part, continue to provide the content that we were able to provide last um, at the last event. So. Um, so that's it for my side of the GLAC report. And Bob, anything else to add? Yeah, well, we're just uh, one of the things that we're, we've talked about is making sure that we have a little bit of time between presentations so there's no overlap on the Zoom license. And so learning. Experience. Yeah, we, I will be I will be kicking Jeff Cupmanis off the board if he does not embed the time for, for uh, doing that. I I was the victim of that mostly, so we we have learned our lesson because I'm not about to. Uh, I was struggling to get from meeting to meeting to meeting, so we we can't have that. We we need to give some time for, you know, that and for licenses. So we that will be better. Um, come that if anything virtual that we do. There will be time in between the presentations to make sure that they start on time, end on time, and that there's no hitch. All right, and whatever form GLAC takes this year, you can count on the Warren Astronomical Society to support it. Uh, we've got two other subgroup chapters that are kind of dormant right now, merch and discussion group. So we will move right on to observing reports, and I've got David Levy first in the queue. David? You're on. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me okay. Before I do my poem of the month for you, I do want to add an addition to the solar report. I know Diane had mentioned that there's absolutely no solar activity going on right now, with the exception that this today, I saw a very nice filament in hydrogen alpha on the sun, the second one we've seen in um, in just a couple of weeks. And uh, uh, there are no sunspots, just a few prominences, but uh, very nice filament. For the poem that I'd like to read to you today, it, it comes from a Canadian, one of my fellow Canadians, uh, just an 18 year old. And so you see an 18 year old writing a poem, you really don't expect very much. This one, however, turned into possibly the most famous Canadian poem ever written. 
Uh, Ronald Reagan read part of it after the Challenger disaster in 1986, and I'm going to read it to you right now in honor of the night sky. It's called High Flight. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced to the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent lifting mind I've trod the high untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. Thank you. Back to you. That is indeed a beautiful poem, David. Thank you. All right. Who else has got some observing reports? I pretty much gave mine with the astrophotography segments. I that was an awesome again. picture, David Green. That was that pillar picture is incredible. Well, so really quickly, it almost never happened. I took a picture on the side of the road uh, and said, that looks pretty good and was ready to turn around because it was cloudy and I wanted Milky Way over the pond, not um, just more clouds. But I said, nah, finished the job. I actually had done a, I was heading back home, did another 180 and continued to um, Alcona Dam's pond and uh, just started shooting at Orion and at the uh, neighboring area. I did notice columns of light near me. Beautiful moonrise, by the way. Um, and um, I noticed those columns of light, but I knew where they were coming from, so it didn't cross my line that there may be light fillers out there. I took a few shots, looked up, and said, is there a problem with my image? I looked and noticed with the naked eye that I was seeing light fillers. And um, I'm going to have to turn on my light. I, I noticed that I was seeing those naked eye. They were faint, but they were there. So I said, those light fillers are real. Took a few more images, made it back home, managed to get unstuck from the snow, and uh, posted a few of those images. And, you know, the rest is kind of history with those. It was. It was a wonderful trip. It was cold and the pond was frozen. So I was able to walk out on that pond, but um, I enjoyed it and I was glad I went ahead and went to Alcona Dam Pond and continued my mission because I otherwise I would have never gotten those at that image or those images. So that's my report. Very cool. You're in Mark. It looks like you're trying to show us something. Mark Jacobuson. I'm seeing your email right now. Mark, you trying to show us some pictures? All right, there it is. It was hiding on me. Gotcha. Right. Yeah, I was just going to show last night, uh, went out to uh, Anchor Bay over at uh, Brandenburg Park and caught a nice, uh, caught a nice moonrise. And it was interesting Ooh. because there was, uh, there was a lot of haze from um, all the ice and warm air that we had so it was like a uh a bit of a fog bank between us and the rising moon made for a very orange moon that i almost didn't catch uh till it was uh halfway up because it was so muted and and deep orange but it's kind of kind of a nice uh nice night indeed yeah, that's a beautiful shot i tried Thanks. something like that i had a golden opportunity to shoot that orange moon coming up over uh, Lake Huron, you know, the expanse of the lake and that moon. I took a couple of wide angle shots. I tried to take a narrow shot and failed miserably. It, it didn't come out the way I had hoped. My picture is basically an orange blob hovering over what looks like a painting of some water. But at least I have something documented. Yeah. And I'll have to try again next month. 
Yeah, and those light pillars, by the way, are, are really fascinating that you captured uh, and posted in the uh, in the wasp. That, that's really cool. Yeah, uh, almost a lucky occurrence. I mean, with all the colors, <laughs> I think that town is Curtisville that I would that provided most of those light pillars. And uh, cool. it was for those that care, it was done with a Sony a 6000 mirrorless camera that I normally don't use for uh, night sky images. All right, very good. I have one to share. Yes, please. So, um, I am oops, oops, starting to image the Rosette Nebula. Lovely. And I got um, about two and a half hours on it. And I am, I just came in from outside. I set up for tonight. It's clear. I think tomorrow's going to be clear too. So, I'm going to see if I can get some of that noise out of there. It's uh, it's pretty prominent in the sky right now. So it's a new refractor for me. So I'm enjoying that right now. Yep, that's very no that's a very noisy image. Yeah, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> well, I I think there's quite a bit of noise. <laughs> you know, I can see the noise, but like, okay, so compare it to your horse head. So <laughs> you look at that now. Go to your horse head image, and you'll see. A lot less of that. Look well, that was done there. at f one point nine. So okay. yeah, yeah, I got so, a little more signal. <laughs> yeah, for those that are asking you like noise, that's what we mean. But knowing uh, Dale, he'll he'll start to work on getting some more. He's got techniques to get that noise out and get a cleaner look to that image. You got the detail in there. Yeah. He'll he'll get a cleaner look to that image. Yeah, um, you know, it, it's uh, one or two real. more nights, and this should uh, start. Uh, becoming a smoother yeah so so that's my target that i'm working on yeah that's a great start all right any more observing reports if not i can yield I, the floor well I'll, i would like to give a special uh shout out to gm ross that i see over there Mm -hmm. visual astronomer who's looking at all this astrophotography maybe he's rolling his eyes maybe he isn't but uh just so you know next time i go to image i actually plan to bring an observation tool with me surprise surprise i want to see what some of this dark sky stuff looks like to the naked eye i come from a visual background and i would like to uh i'd like to see some detail with my cornea as well to see uh some of the differences between what I've looked at from some of the uh, observing spots here, lower Michigan, go up to the thumb and enjoy seeing some detail that I may not see normally. I like to try to combine my astro imaging with observation. And when I do that, I will be adding that to my report. Very nice. All right. Well, if y'all are set on observing reports, I can yield the floor to our first vice yeah. president, Dale Parton, to kick us off with the first short presentation for the night. Okay, thank you, Diane. Um, our short presentation tonight is going to be given by our own Gary Ross, uh, well known for his rather eclectic presentation style. Uh, Gary has been a member of the Warren Club since time immemorial. Uh, his observing equipment has an ancient pedigree. He would probably say second to none. Uh, and his presentation style is, let's just say, enjoyed by many. Uh, his topic tonight is the case against Mars. Gary? Thank you, Dr. Parton. And straight to the point, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Can, can you hear me well? There's a bit of echo. All right. That's all we can do. But Clayton says it's the best we can do. Moving right along. Uh, currently, especially this winter, 
This is the age of Mars. What do you mean? Wait, I mean. The March issue of the National Geographic. The March issue of the National Geographic has the cover story of Mars and the little subtitle why it is so important to us. And despite what I may be saying here for the next few minutes, it is important to me too. Comma, however. Um, this is the last month, February was the month of a jackpot with three missions approaching Mars from three different scientific and national entities. I would like to remind the members and I had to learn this myself last year, that the Soviet Union pioneered Mars expeditions in the 1960s. They flew five missions starting in 1960 before our successful Mariner flyby. Five missions, very Russian. They were just too dumb to know when they were defeated, which is why they prevailed on the Eastern Front. But we should skip forward in brief passing and in tribute to what I call Viking Summer of 1976. When the United States, I was out east at that time at school, when the United States put two landers a full hemisphere apart successfully. I couldn't believe it. I did not think it would work. But the US pulled that off and to my mind, those two Viking missions were the greatest uh, achievement in space exploration next to the Apollo program. It was an achievement beyond parallel when we consider the era in which it was performed. Now, why is Mars so important to us? When Mariner 9 was about to go into orbit in 1971, there was a major seminar at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And one of the speakers, he may have been the convener, made this point that we go to Mars with such diligence because we want Mars to be like the Earth. Now, he didn't say this, I am saying it. It is the element of mythos or mythos in the driving of the human experiment. We want to go to a place that is like our own. And to be fair, Mars is the most Earth-like. But remember, comrades, it is not the Earth. Part of our fascination with Mars is distant echo of the Percival Lowell legacy. He was a man who had his faults, but he was committed. And he also had the spirit of mythology that he was driven by great visions. And it has come down to us today. And one could say that for those in science, the Lowell era ended in April of 1963 when infrared observations came in from the 200 inch Hale telescope, which showed that the atmosphere was negligible and there were no vegeta vegetation signatures. There was nothing in IR that would indicate that Mars was in any way hospitable to life, quote, as we know it, italics added. When I was in Junior high school, I was in choir until I became too sophisticated. I remember this one song. I was just getting involved in astronomy at this time, and I don't know the title. It was, it starts out, God of our fathers, whose almighty hand, something, something, all the starry band of shining worlds in splendor through the sky. And I remember in my when I was perhaps 12 years old, that I found those words especially stirring of shining worlds in splendor through the sky. And this was the day in which I had not even seen Mars yet, but there was something evocative. And I appeal to all who are interested in astronomy to mind that, because there is far more going on in the solar system 
than Mars has to offer, as much as he has to offer. And my central thesis, I will put it in now before I enumerate my, let us say, alternatives. I will not see objection. It is time for the United States to stand down from Mars exploration. We have done enough and we have done magnificently, especially D-Day last month. There are other players in space exploration now, and they're perfectly capable of carrying the ball of Mars. But we have or should have other things on the agenda in the shining worlds of the solar system. When I look at the solar system, such a variegated family of planets that we must not shortchange the other opportunities that we have. And those opportunities are plentiful. I have a, a list here roughly in the order of desirability, and I will run through them flank speed. But sometimes we forget these things, so taken as we are with Mars exploration. And of course, we must never forget what drives all of this, or a good part of it, and gets the funding to do it, is what I call the L word. See, this is L. In, in the alph alphabet. And we all know what the L word stands for, and that keeps us going and going on Mars. But there are other possibilities too. Venus. USSR led the way for a long time in Venus explorations, and well within my lifetime, it was referred to as Earth's twin or Earth's sister. Now we know that that is true only in gross dimensions. There is no way that a hell planet like Venus can be considered our twin. But of late, there are indications in the atmosphere of possible phosphines. Now it would take a biochemist to explain, and I am not one, why phosphines or traces thereof might be indications of atmosphere, atmospheric life if one thinks of the dense Venus atmosphere as a liquid, practically, and we have a plentiful life in the oceans of Earth, perhaps something like this has come into being of unknown description, unknown biochemistry in the atmosphere of Venus. This bears close attention. Pluto. Now, one of the most American things one can say is, been there, done that, and I find that to be morally reprehensible. We should return to Pluto. It is a fascinating place. I more properly should refer to it as the pluto charon system because it is a planetoid system. Planetoid has gone out of, out of use, so we call it dwarf planet, whatever, minor planet. It is a system, but this time it should be an orbiter which would add immeasurably to the time of the journey. It should, this probe should go into orbit around the barycenter, thereby getting all sorts of fascinating views of this amazing conservation, or if you will, this partnership in the outer solar system or beyond the limits of the solar system, if one wants to be accurate about it and call these things kite belt objects. Titan. What an amazing place Titan is. There has been scuttlebutt of late of prebiotic conditions, or perhaps giving rise in the evolutionary biota to nothing we have ever experienced before. It is the only moon in the solar system with an atmosphere even worth talking about. It ha Titan has weather, Titan has geomorphology, it has changing landforms. Now, the atmospheric chemistry and the ground chemistry is, is horrible. Uh, there was a recent uh, editorial, not an editorial piece, a science piece uh, but in the New York Times, which indicated it might be nice to swim a submarine through track and Mara. Mara, I find that fascinating, but I believe it's a bit of a stretch and beyond our technological capabilities. But nonetheless, the Europeans did a magnificent job of putting a lander on Titan. And we should do it too. A crawler. 
and I'm sure that they would be happy to follow our example. Mercury. One says, who cares about Mercury? I care about Mercury. I, 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 I give you this. The first Mariner uh, observations, the first Mariner probe was 1973 to 1974, do the arithmetic, and there has been no attempt to land anything on Mercury. That heavy little world. Now, one says, well, who cares? It's just a barren rock. Well, the same can be said about the moon. But on Mercury, it is a, uh, the planet is within that gravitational well of the sun, which is why its orbital period was such a puzzle for such a long time. We should land petrographic microscopes on probes on Mercury to do mineralogical analysis. And I asked, wouldn't it be nice as night falls on Mercury to see the landscape as it cools in various wavelengths of infrared. I'm sure the probe would not last too long, but even a few weeks observation would be worth the effort and let us never forget putting a seismograph on that little world so close to the sun. Might be a very interesting experiment with fascinating results, especially if there were two landers on Mercury so one could triangulate the data. Europa. The United States is going to send the Europa Clipper in 2024, and as far as I'm concerned, not soon enough. It will be possible to land by one of those crevices and do ice samples on a lander. If we can put this uh, Mars probe down in a teacup on Mars, we can certainly land something close to one of those uh, uh, presumably subduction zones or upwelling zones. And of course, it would be nice to have a microscope to look for biota. Callisto. It was with my little five centimeter refractor so very long ago, I realized how blue Callisto is. Why is Callisto so blue as opposed to, uh, to her neighbor, Ganymede? The Albedos are so very different. Ganymede is 0 0.43 albedo, and Callisto is 0 0.17. Why? We should be landing on Callisto to take soil samples, and of course, do what to, is, to my mind, the requisite microscopic analysis. And again, doing seismic studies on such a large world would also have its own charms and yield interesting results. Now out beyond what we call the solar system, floating ever so slowly in the dark of near interstellar space, although they are solar system objects, we have Eris and Sedna. Eris is as big as Pluto, and Sedna is slightly bigger. The color of Sedna is fascinating. Why is Sedna so ruddy? Are we looking at a surface made up of complex organics that have been bombarded for a billion years by uh, interstellar cosmic rays, or that's a redundancy, sorry, by cosmic rays? Or could it be that Sedna was once much closer to the sun to receive solar ultraviolet. Now, we will never in this century be able to land on Sedna or Eris, but a determined flyby, close in especially, would be of great value because one could do the sampling of the near space to these worlds and see if there is any sort of biovulcanism going on. But these worlds are totally unknown to us and should receive a decent amount of attention. And then there's my, my favorite dwarf planet, which is Ceres. I was in the seventh grade when I first learned of the existence of Ceres. And in those days, that little world's size was not well known, but I thought it would be charming in the tradition of the little prince 
to emigrate there and be the emperor of Ceres and to do walkabouts and do mapping and be all by myself so I wouldn't have to go to school anymore. Ceres is very dark. 0 0.07 albedo. Why is Ceres so dark? Well, there is clear evidence of some sort of cryovolcanism and we should be taking soil samples. The escape velocity of Ceres is only 0 0.5 kilometers per second, a tiny fraction of that of the Earth. It would be grand to have a sample return mission go to Ceres and doing it in doing it in grand style. None of this having to hunt for little tubes of, uh, of, of samples with uh, pattern recognition software. No, do it like a man. Just send out scoops, fill the saddlebags and then take off for Earth when we can put it the, the return capsule in the Earth orbit for convenient uh, retrieval at some other date. The Gemini astronauts, I assure you, would have had no problem. So, I have, or as they say in litigation, further the deponent saith not, I urge once again that perhaps we could throttle back on Mars and have these shining worlds pretty much to ourselves. Well, Mr. Ross, I'm going to have to request that one of our artists like Jeff McLeod do a rendition of you as the uh, Emperor of Ceres. Yeah, yeah that, that would be the life. No more having to look at Mr. Winston for the afternoon and having him look at me. No <laughs> homework. And uh, well, I could watch all the television I wanted to. It would be a good life, far from the madding crowd. Um, I stole that one. <laughs> All right, do we have any questions for Gary? Questions or comments? It struck dumb. Yeah. I actually have a question. Go, Adrian. Um, which world? If you had the choice to say we are going to let Mars go and pick another world, what is the top priority world that you think we should go to? Well, I listed them, Adrian, in roughly the matter of the, the manner of desirability, except you know the top of the list. I I, I listened to Clayton's counsel. Uh, he's very interested in, in in Pluto, so I I put Pluto near the top. But the first of the list was Venus. That's our, our near neighbor and ha must have had a very interesting planetary history with that retrograde rotation and that positively horrendous atmosphere. I know that landers don't last long on Venus and all due respect to the Soviets, I think, no, I maintain we could do better now. But that's I would tend to agree. Venus. Well, I think that's a good call. I I like Pluto, although that would be a long, you know, it'd be another 10 year mission. Um, so it wouldn't be as fast to say Venus or, you know, able to pull out in the next few years. Um, and I also like the Mercury thought as well. Um, I know that all the ice, the ice worlds are on a uh, are on the radars for seeing if a submarine in one of uh, Europa or Enceladus yields life. Um, the L word, I think that was one of the L words you were mentioning. So uh, no, very, very interesting uh, and logical discussion there. Thank you. I almost, said, I almost said thank you, Mr. President, but I didn't want to get <laughs> See your head get swelled. Yeah. Ah. 
I noticed you did not mention Uranus or Neptune at all. Those those two are the ugly stepchildren of the solar system exploration. We've had one fly by in the 1980s, and that's it. I think we have a lot to learn from those two. Triton. And I Triton. Agree. Yeah, I, I agree, Bob. I didn't want to add Neptune. The list is already so long. But that that world could be a pan palasa with equatorial winds of in excess of 1,200, maybe uh, pushing 700 kilometers per hour. It would be wonderful also to investigate Triton, the cryovolcanic moon. I agree with you. I think I think you're right with, with Titan. I think Titan is the one you are absolutely right on that, Gary. That's a, that is uh, the most interesting of all those objects, I think. I mean, Venus, Venus is the one that has obvious relevance to human life and the future of our planet. So it's really inexcusable that we haven't put more effort into it. But uh, there are there are some planned missions, but they're scheduled for the early 2030s at this point. See, that's my point, John. Early 2030s. It was not like this in the days of my youth, the heroic era. Hell, we were robbing Gemini's up there every three months. But there I go, living in the past. How about Ceres? Ceres? Ceres. Oh. What? C E R E S. Ceres. Yeah, Ceres. I mentioned Ceres. That's yeah, the one did. That I wanted to be the emperor of. Sorry about that. <laughs> he did. Not there late, Gary. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes, right. You're, you're, you're like the Soviets in late and on the winning side. See, si. yeah, <laughs> da. Ceres is such an odd duck. I mean, it's like it almost doesn't belong where it is at all. It's it's more like a Kuiper Belt object. It's, it's more a planet. Like a, it's more like a round it's a planet test. It's a planet. It's a real planet. It has a core. It has a differentiated geological composition. It is a planet. It's big enough to be uh, carved into a habitat. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't bet the farm on that, but that's that's perhaps off the subject. But yes, it is a planet. You're quite right, Jonathan. All right. It looks like it has, it has a question, and then I think we need to take this yeah. to a break so y'all can all have a virtual fist fight. Laura. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, you know, Keith, Laura, you have to go off mute, Laura. Okay. Okay. <laughs> can anybody hear me? Oh, no, yeah. your, your audio is distorted. Laura, you're muted. Let's see. Can you hear me? Your audio is very yes. distorted. Yes, we can hear you. We can't hear Laura, though. She had a We're going to out for a long time. What should I, should I start or what? They take a break. Take a break. Y'all are going to give me another mic. Where is, where is okay. that? La, la Seance Ajourne. Is Dale there? Yes. Well, Laura, question for Carrie was, uh, which planet would we be able to uh, uh, get around on where we could put people that could drive around or live there? All right. You're asking about, you're asking about getting... As you say, people there. I do not address that question. I only am talking about um, automata uh, and landers and crawlers and flybys. It has nothing to do with manned missions at all. I know, but that's my question. Well, I want to go to Ceres, all right? I don't care what you all people want to do. For you. <laughs> right. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, I miss you terribly. Mainly terrible. So, what what is with the what is the obsession with Mars? Why why do you think there's so much emphasis on Mars? Well, I just I just said, I just said, it's the planet that is most like Earth. Hello, can you hear me? This is Gibble again. I can answer that question. Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Gilbert. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> this is an awkward way to begin. Yeah. But at any rate, the reason for the great interest in Mars to me is apparent. 
the closest thing that has any possibility of having a climate similar to ours that could support microorganisms. And therefore, to answer the greatest question confronting mankind, are we alone? Mars makes the perfect place to attack initially, not going off to Calisto or somewhere. Now, we also did Mars, as you know, in Viking in 1976, and we got a positive answer at two Viking lander sites. Four positives, five controls, all supporting the positive. And NASA would never go back. NASA claimed they could not accept the result because the organic analysis machine found no organics. Well, it couldn't find organics on Earth. I remember that. And yet they sent it. But since then, of course, Curiosity and Pathfinder and uh, have found large amounts of complex organics, including the likelihood of having found kerogen, which comes only from living matter. Now, in their official peer-reviewed publication, they said it is likely kerogen. But in a private interview with the author that was published, he said definitely kerogen. But he said it could be abiotic kerogen. There ain't no such thing as abiotic kerogen. But at any rate, the reason for going to Mars is it's the most likeliest place to answer our deepest question that we've asked ever since man could think. Now, can I go back to my talk? Let's do, I think we want to do yes. a break, right? Normally we do right. a break between the short talk and the long talk. So we'll give everybody about 15 minutes to do a bio break, and then we'll turn things over to you for the rest of the night, sir. Okay. David, I D David, I answered your question by the way on chat. David Levy, you can t take a look at chat. Are we officially on break? Roger that. I'm not Roger. <laughs> Roger Rogers from Airplane, one of my favorite movies. Yeah, I loved it too. It was cool. Good job, Mr. Ross. Yes. Where'd he go? Oh, there he is. Muzzle okay. tough, Mr. Ross. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Very, very good there, Gary. Very good. Which one do you like? Which one do you like the best, David? Of those three? You're muted. You're muted. You're still muted. There, talk, Dad. What? Talk. What about uh, you? You were muted, David. Okay, now I'm unmuted. I think just about any of those would be an equally fascinating presentation. Yeah. I hope I'll be able to attend it. Thanks. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm leaning toward uh, toward uh, Edmund Halley. Uh, I, uh, Holly, he's he's he was uh, uh, one of my favorites of all time because he was such a, uh, uh, a a people person is what he was. His uh, his ability to uh, to you know how many people in history could actually talk to Isaac Newton without being insulted, and he was one of the only ones. 
Yeah, I guess so. And he certainly, you certainly have a good point there. <clears throat> Another suggestion might be Eugene Shoemaker. Oh, he would the founder be of astral geology. Yep, would be a uh, certainly something because that was a very important date in his oh. life, as you know. Yep. As you yes. know. <laughs> that that might be one for future. I I yeah, I, I do future. one on Edmund Halley, but I would I, that Gene Schubert would be perfect. I would love to do that. That's yeah. okay. a great suggestion. I like that Thanks. one. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. Sure. <clears throat> What are you doing, uh, Gary? Oh, Eclipse Observer. Oh, yeah, I don't have any of those. <laughs> Gary, it looks like you uh, stepped into the uh, mid-1970s there. For a moment? <laughs> I don't know. It's still a, a hot pink solarized uh, view of the world that I'm seeing. Sure. I see a Larry Kalinowski solar observing badge, but it is in hot pink and yellow and yep. ochre and other various very 1970s <laughs> yes indeed uh shades maybe late 1960s could go either way i want to get some more of these is what i want to get i can't seem to find them anywhere well because we need to make some more we hey we're looking for we're looking for a merchandise chair this uh, is a and, it's a wonderful piece right here. Andy, uh, I'm going to tell you guys, the uh, the Vatican Observatory is, uh, I said, we're doing this whole huge <laughs> website <laughs> revamp. And uh, one of the things we're doing is we're selling merchandise through uh, Printful. So the guys that are, do that are doing this, we, we, we've designed a whole bunch of like, you know, backpacks, t-shirts, sweatshirts, buttons, uh, bumper stickers and stuff like that. It might be something we want to look into. Yeah, I know. That means I'm volunteering, doesn't it? <laughs> you bet. So right. I, I, I have a question I want to pass by you guys. Some, some of the three the astronomers and stuff. This is just a, a question about gravity and physics that's been bothering me for a while. So here we have this galaxy. You know, the Milky Way has 400 billion stars in it, right? <laughs> now right. we know that. Most, if not all, galaxies have a supermassive black hole in their core. Why is that? We don't know. But if our galaxy did not have a supermassive black hole in the core, what would be going on with 400 billion stars worth of gravity? The center of gravity would still be the center of the galaxy. Wouldn't it create a gravitational zone that stuff would want to migrate into? I don't know. I mean, could, would a black hole form there because stuff just wants to go there? I mean, what 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 would this, what happens at the center of gravity of four hundred billion stars if there's no supermassive black hole there? Probably not. Probably there's a lot. There's several galaxies that don't have black holes, and uh, um, I, I guess. Uh, a lot of people say that the reason that galaxies stay together has more to do with um, with dark dark matter than it does with uh, with black holes. Uh, the dark matter is pretty much what holds it together, apparently, um, and uh, that's that, that's the study. And uh, and uh, uh, black holes are really a minor part, uh, although they are huge and such. I mean, there's black holes all the way through the whole darn place, you know. But that center black hole. You know, has been forming for, well, probably more than the four billion years, whatever it's, you know, whatever the number of, I don't know the exact number of the age of the galaxy itself. I guess the galaxy is somewhere in the range of eight billion or something. I don't know that for sure. But, Any idea uh, what the population of black holes is in the galaxy? Well, it but the point be is billions, like, shouldn't it? But but if you get but if you get enough black holes, what happens is they draw to one another. That's what happens. Their gravity is such that when a star dies, it's anywhere within the infinity. There you go. So, um, uh, so the black holes, you know, may have to do with the formation of the galaxy. If the galaxy was made up of many white hot stars, okay, you're going to have lots of black holes. It's what you're going to have. Um, that's uh, because of the mass of them. 
And then, of course, mass draws mass. But what holds the galaxy together, as far as I've been told, is really dark matter. That's why they don't fall apart. Um, and uh, and dark matter apparently has lots of mass. <clears throat> so there you go. What is it? What's that uh, particle called? The wimp? The wimp? Isn't that what it's called? That uh, it's supposed to be a, a massive uh, particle or something like that, I guess. It's a very interesting study. There's no question about that. But again, you know, we're still learning, aren't we? Well, uh, uh, we're always going to be learning it until until we figure out what the hell's going on with dark matter. Yeah, if we could ever figure that out, you know, and and then you got to go take the other step. You got to go, what is dark energy? I mean, literally, what is that? And if they tell us that sixty five percent or whatever the number is of the of the universe is made up of dark energy, my goodness, <laughs> you know, that's that's pretty significant. Baryonic matter makes up what five percent. So, wow. What we don't know. That's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. It's nuts. But again, that's what happens. What are you showing us this time, uh, Gary? Is that a, a, a Mars? Is that a Mars globe? I think that's a Mars globe he's showing. Yes. Uh, good. Okay. And it looks gorgeous to me. Yeah, I think it's great too. That looks like the uh, old army maps from uh, before 1963. Stop that. 63 isn't that long ago. <laughs> well, uh, 1963 was the last time the uh i mean that could be shopper early too i guess but uh but the army was publishing maps showing the canali up until up until uh yeah. the uh, radar observations sure chaper and uh and uh in our, our very very dear dear uh what's his name uh it was the the, the oh. chaparelli is i guess is with, with was that is that correct yeah that correct Schiaparelli, Schiaparelli. Yeah. Schiaparelli, I guess it was, right? Yeah, and then there was, uh, and then of course, uh, what's his name? Um, why am I having Percival that? Lowell. Yeah, Percival Lowell, Pluto. <laughs> Percival Lowell uh, uh, was damn sure of it. He figured that was it. I'll yeah. point out that the uh, nickname for the Perseverance rover is Percy, uh, and it's not officially in honor of him, but... Uh, you know, I think it's a little bit in honor of him. Yeah, they probably that probably chose that was probably one of the reasons they chose it. I'm sure. I agree. Well, perseverance is a great name, but yep. Well, I hope that it really does the does the trick. I I you know I just think that um, we'll see. The only thing that bothers me is is they should be pouring more money into into the robotics than the people going there. That's all. Well, <laughs> I mean, we're just ready for. <laughs> I'm ready for the uh, James Webb so Space Telescope to stop eating the budget of every other mission at NASA. So, <laughs> it is, it is. You bet. So hopefully, we'll just... I can get launched and we'll be done with it, and it'll stop killing programs to keep it alive. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> well, I, I just want to see it stay alive when it gets launched. Yeah, all me too. this yeah, time, and I would, it, I would yeah. not want. Oh gosh, <laughs> I would it's, not want something to not deploy. Yeah, which, I mean, it's web. literally, well, literally it, something like twenty-five missions uh, were scrapped at various stages to keep that thing alive. So it had better be a success, is all I can say. Well, it's the only way we're going to be able to see space if Elon Musk launches yeah. the forty-two thousand satellites. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's. He's well on the well, way. So I have a, yeah, I have a report about that. One of the quick Im thirty second images I took while in the thumb. Uh -huh. um, I suppose I can start my video. One of the, um, one of the images I took had a constellation going through it. It only took thirty a thirty second image, and you could see streaks going right through the uh, sword of Orion. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, it's, you know, out here, you can see the, the constellation, the satellites are just a lot more prevalent. Um, well, you, you, you know. and you, and you only have, he's only put up what uh, a couple of thousand and he's going to put up 42. I think he's only put up a couple hundred so far. Is that I right? Was, I didn't know. I, I didn't still know. Hear a thousand. Yeah. I could be wrong. But 42,000, goodness gracious. It's, it's a weird, it's a, you know. 
internet everywhere is a nice thing. I mean, I think we had this discussion last time. Yep. We all would like to have inter- you know, better internet or better uh, service. I barely have phone service when I go to the thumb. Um, but the consequence of that is you have to take more frames because just about every frame is going to have a satellite going through it. Yep. Musk is a four-letter word. <laughs> <laughs> It's right. like there's 1,023 of them launched so far. How many? Okay, wow. 1,023. 1,023. They, they just got over the 1,000 mark this week then, I think. 1,000, that's yeah. all, and they're going to do 42,000? My goodness gracious. This and don't it. forget, it's not only Elon Musk and SpaceX. Yeah, and Amazon and everyone there's, else. Yep. Yeah, Amazon, there's lots of uh, competitors that are going to launch yep. their uh, satellites, and you can bet they're not as concerned about the – any requests coming in from the astronomical community, such as you oh, know, I think, do something okay. about it. I think some companies will be more receptive and some companies will be less, but I hope Amazon will do better, but we'll see. I don't know. This yeah. pursuit of dollars. Either. You know. All right, gang. It's been 15 minutes. I hope everybody enjoyed their bio break and snack break, but we have a uh, outside guest tonight, so I'd like to turn things back over to... Program Chair Dr. Dale Parton to introduce our speaker for the long form presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Diane. Uh, and uh, Dr. Levin, sorry for the delay. Um, starting back in the 1960s, Dr. Gilbert Levin pioneered techniques for the detection of microbial life. This led NASA to award him and his company uh, contracts to develop methods for the detection of extraterrestrial life on spacecraft missions. Uh, and Dr. Levin was ultimately the lead scientist for one of the experiments on the two 1976 Viking lander missions to detect life. We will be hearing about that tonight. NASA also asked Dr. Levin to serve on its planetary quarantine advisory panel. His topic tonight is uh, involves a question we would all like to know the answer to, is there life on Mars? Dr. Levin, you have the floor. Thank you very much. We've been through a lot already tonight. <laughs> Well, dear fellow space enthusiasts, tonight I come to you in deep sorrow because my co-experimenter, who was initially invited by Dale to make this talk, Dr. Patricia Ann Stratt, died on October 23rd, 2020. So she was not only my co-experimenter, she was brilliant, and she became a personal friend of me and my wife's for 50 years. So I hate to be taking her place. So please uh, bear with me a little on this. But my subject is perhaps the most fascinating subject that mankind has faced since he could think. He's been wondering, you know, am I alone? Is there anything else alive, any place in the universe? And that's why when I hear geologists talking about how important rocks and stones are, which is what NASA has mostly been facing, uh, I really can't believe it. For example, I gave a talk once at the Cosmos Club in Washington and I debated with Jim Garvin whether or not we had detected life on Mars. After the debate, a lady came up to him and said, Dr. Garvin, do you think it's more important to discover a mineral or a living microorganism on Mars? He didn't hesitate. He said, of course, a geological specimen. Well, that kind of threw me. So I believe, however, that most people are more interested in is there another form of life anywhere or is our life anywhere even if only a microorganism 
NASA, when contemplating the experiment initially, and still describes it this way, as possibly the greatest experiment in the history of science. I had the extraordinary luck to be among the first humans to seek extraterrestrial life. Well, wait, I have to correct myself. You know who the first person was? Louis Pasteur. When the Oregon meteorite fell outside of Paris, Louis raced there, got there while it was still warm. And you may remember he invented the infusion broth, which confirmed the presence of microorganisms when he put a sample of suspected material into this hay infusion broth. And if there were anything alive in there and would eat any of the ingredients from the hay infusion broth, it would produce tiny bubbles and tiny bubbles were the evidence for life. Well, Louis, with his great vision, raced to the Orgoy, took a piece of it and put it in his hay infusion broth and watched it for several days. No bubbles. He thought that he had not succeeded. But he had succeeded because the simple method he developed is today used by you, every one of you, and billions of people around the world. It's the method still after 100, 200 years is used to test the microbial quality of potable water. Every health department uses it. They use a simplified nutrient, uh, much simpler than the complex that uh, Louis stuff spewed forth. But they take formate and make a broth of it and put the sample of water from taps from all over the city. They probably sometime come in your house and they incubate this at 37 degrees for several days. And if bubbles appear, that's evidence for contamination and they do something about it. Well, I took that simple experiment to make it more sensitive. I used radioactive carbon as a tag on the formate, and I added other uh, ingredients as well. I used this first uh, on Earth because I began as a sanitary engineer, and I tested this and published on it, and it went great. However, only the state of Illinois ever used it because the others were too afraid of that word radioactive. Carbon-14 is radioactive. Even though the amount used per test was below the limit the AEC would let you drink in a day. But that was a magic word. Today, the thing is still used. What got me on my path to Mars was the fact that my wife was a reporter for Newsweek magazine in Washington, D.C., and her boss, Ernest Lindley, threw an annual Christmas party, and we went, and I happened to sit down and share a martini with Keith, Keith Glennon, A. Keith Glennon, the first administrator of NASA. And I don't know why it came to me, but I was frustrated not having my that accept it. I said, is NASA ever thinking about sending something to Mars to look for life? He said, funny you should ask. We hired a physician just yesterday. I said, well, I have a crackpot idea. He said, why don't you go down and talk to him? I'll tell him you're coming. Well, the rest is history. NASA liked the idea. I tested it for 10 years to complete the science. Then I hired uh, Pat to come join me. She left Johns Hopkins University to join my tiny company, Biospherics. And she was a biochemist. So I showed her how the gadget worked and she became an engineer and helped TRW develop the instrument that actually went to Mars. She worked 10 years 
uh, doing that. Without her, I don't think they'd have solved the problems and we never would have gotten to Mars. Now uh, let me... Yeah, I need one more. Well, how does this thing work? Very simple. You take a tiny cup and you put half a cc of soil in it that you want to test for living microorganisms. And then you put in 0.15 milliliters of this radioactive tagged nutrient, which consists of formate still, glycolate, glycine, DNL versions of alanine, and DNL versions of lactate. And you put this thing to incubate at 10 degrees, we select it because on Mars, if you put it to incubate at Mars temperature, it would just freeze. So we kept it at 10 degrees, which we felt would not do any damage and would let the organisms thrive. If all of the nutrient were used, it would produce 257,000 counts per minute. But strangely, for reasons we never really figured out, when we ran tests on living organisms, they only produced about 15 to 17,000 counts per minute. So this is something, I guess they produce some poison that uh, stops their metabolism at that point. Um, we did something that neither Louis Pasteur nor any of the thousands of cities around the world testing their drinking water do. We were going to a far off place. We were not satisfied to just get a positive. It's always been my belief the most important part of any experiment is a control. So we got NASA to develop a control that they would agree to. And it was, if you get a positive, you take a duplicate sample of the same soil, heat it to 160 degrees C, which would kill any microorganism on Earth, or at least kill almost all of them, let it cool and then run the labeled release test, the release test we took to Mars. If you got zero or essentially zero, that proves that your first test results came from living microorganisms because 160 degrees isn't hot enough to destroy oxidants that could attack these vulnerable chemicals. So we insisted on having a control and the public health people today, it's still a standard method, do not have a control. They're satisfied if they get bubbles, that's proof. If they don't, that's proof. By the time we got finished on Mars, however, people challenged us saying, well, maybe these chemicals are destroyed at 160 degrees. So we reduced the temperature in a whole series of controls down to 10 degrees C, and that killed whatever the active agent was as well. If we let it sit in a tube for two months, it stopped working, the activity disappeared. It's hard to explain chemically. Where did this thing go? Oh, yeah. here's what it looks like. Oh, you're not displaying it on there. How can I display it on You here? have to go to share. Where's that? Here. Get some. Share again? Yes, that's what we're going to do. Okay. Now you got to get your PowerPoint up over there. Yep, we can yep. see your screen now. We can see the PowerPoint. It's empty. But you don't see the the diagram of the gadget. Not no. yet, no. I see a blank PowerPoint. Mm. 
There, okay, here, let me. All right. Uh, green, you, you always go for the green button. Now it's gone. You just have to make to put play up there at the top. There it goes. Okay, roll it down. No, just scroll. It's open now. Hold it. Hold it. No, I wouldn't worry about that. There. Oops. Just hold Can it. Can I do this? Cancel that first. Come on. Yeah, you'll need to cancel that pop up box. Cancel okay. that box up box. Cancel right there, Deb. Yeah, cancel. There we go. There you go. Now you got to play it. At the top, it says, uh, just hit it. Okay. That's yeah, there you go. And you can see just a tiny incubation chamber. It was about uh, 10, 20 cubic centimeters. And you put the soil in, inject the nutrient, just 0.15 milliliters, and the gas rises up, and you've got carbon-14 detectors in there, and we collected the gas and recorded the radioactivity for seven days. We got four positives, uh, two at each lander, 4,000 miles apart, and we got five controls that supported the positive. You know, and in using this experiment, we ran more than 4,000 cycles of samples. We never once got a false positive or a false negative. So we feel very confident. Here's some of the places we tested. This is Death Valley. People said there can be no microorganisms on Death Valley sands, there's no water. We went and immediately found microorganisms and JPL who came with us tested the sample and found it had two tenths of a percent, no, nine tenths of a percent of moisture in it. When Curiosity and the Pathfinder tested the soil on Mars, they found two to 4% moisture and yet they were saying that Mars had no water, which was one of the reasons they gave for not finding life. Here we are at the top of White Mountain, 12,000 feet above the timberline, and we found microorganisms. There was only one place in the world that we didn't find any microorganisms, and that was in the Chile Valley where we were up very high and it was very cold, but only that one sample was negative. Now, here are the results. We published many papers, but the two key ones, if you want to read them, are the one by Levin and Strat, the case for extant life on Mars and its possible detection by the Viking label relief experiment published in Astrobiology. And then I published one, Modern Myths of Mars, because I got tired of people saying there could not be life on Mars. And I went down all the myths, which I'm going to do for you indeed. But we increase the number of controls. We duplicate. What do you do when you get a positive response to an experiment? You duplicate it to see whether it's real or not. NASA would never duplicate it, never permitted us to send the experiment back to Mars. So nonetheless, at two landing sites, Viking more than satisfied NASA's pre-mission criteria. Now, Pat Strat published two years ago, a lovely, charming account called To Mars With Love, which is written in lay language, but has all the technical information showing how we developed the experiment and indeed detected life on Mars. Here is the first result we got from Viking Lander 1, Cycle 1. We immediately got a positive response and we got a negative control. Now, 
we followed this for eight days and put a second injection in. People were wondering what it would do. It did the surprising thing of decrease about 20% of the signal in the chamber. And we tested the same thing on Earth and we got a similar response with a soil sample from Alaska. So here was the satisfaction of NASA's criteria for the detection of life. They said, no organics, no life. There goes the ball game. Here are all the cycles for VO1. Here is um, cycle one, the first active, just like we see on Earth. Same amount, 10,000. Then we went for the control, and the control after 160 degrees C in cycle two, it's the bottom one, practically nothing. We then went to repeat the active cycle, and we did. This is all the Lander two cycles, and the same thing. We found positives and one additional thing, two additional things here. One time, we decided we'd heat it only to 50 degrees because they were all complaining that we might be destroying something as a chemical. Well, it reduced the response 70%. We went next to a, a cycle that reduced it to, if you add off all the little peaks, to 12%. So here again, this became a control, as did that, and they supported the existence of life. Now, here's the hard evidence that continues being peer reviewed. Methane was detected several times by a good friend of mine first, uh, Mike, uh, who reported it and was immediately derided. But later on, it was reported again, Curiosity found it. And curiously, not only was there more methane than occurs in Hawaii, but the methane here on Mars came up from special places, localized places that had more moisture in the atmosphere, indicating maybe methanogens are growing there. Pat and I published a paper showing how methanogens could grow. And furthermore, NASA said, whoa, it, it's disappearing so fast, much faster than the ultraviolet light would make it disappear. So it has to have some kind of a sink. Well, methanogens are a sink and they could grow on Mars. Methanogens and methanotrophs could both grow there and be the source and the sink. In addition, NASA took some movies, here's a clip from it, of things that look like Will-O-The-Wisp on Mars. And this they took June 24th, 2019. Now, to me, one of the hardest pieces, except for our experiment, was the finding of stromatolites in images on Mars. Nora Knofny of the University of Virginia first reported them. Then a good friend of mine, Giorgio Bianchiardi at the Siena University in Italy, not only found images on Mars that resembled stromatolites on Earth. Stromatolites are piles of rocks. They look like layers of rocks, but they're made by microorganisms over hundreds of years. And he took a sample uh, from Earth of a stromatolite and compared it statistically with an image that was sent down from Mars. And he found possibility of these two images being so similar is P equal 0. 0.0004. <laughs> That's way above three sigma. And that to me is a very hard piece of evidence. Here are the stromatolites. These are pictures 
that's Earth, that's Mars. And this is the statistical analysis that Giorgio made on Earth and Mars. P equal 0 0.0004. That says an awful lot to me. Now, in addition, there is circumstantial evidence. You know, people have sometimes been convicted on circumstantial evidence. Well, let me go through those. Many terrestrial LR tests show the same amplitude and the same kinetics as I showed you, as did the Mars positives, all using only about 15 to 20 percent of the labeled nutrient. As I said, we did more than 4,000 tests and no false positive or false negative. That's saying a lot for an experiment or for an instrument. No one has ever questioned the instrument. No one has ever questioned the data. They only question the interpretation of the data. Now, we also now know ejecta have been exchanged between Earth and Mars for billions of years. And people in laboratories on Earth have tested the circumstances, the, uh, the temperature to which these ejecta would be raised going through the Earth's atmosphere, going through space, landing on Mars. They have gone through each step and find some species of microorganisms that would sur survive discharge from Earth in a pile of rubble, landing on Mars and growth on Mars. So we know it can be done. David McKay, if you recall, uh, back in, I think it was 96, found what looked like the fossil of a microorganism in a Martian meteorite. And President Clinton even got up and spoke about that. Later, NASA claimed it was too small a fossil to contain DNA. But still later, Organisms that size were found alive on Earth. Terrestrial microorganisms have been grown and survived in more severe environments than those where Viking 1 and Viking 2 landed. But astoundingly, they were even found alive, surviving in outer space on the surface of the International Space Station. The Russians went and pulled wiped some stuff off the windshield, brought it in, and it grew. They also announced at the time of Viking, there could be no life because there was no water on Mars. Well, Viking found water on Mars because it monitored the temperature of the lander footpath, and the temperature started way low below zero, and it went up and it stopped at zero degrees centigrade. Well, what does that mean? That's a, a, un, irrefutable evidence for liquid water. Not only liquid water, but pure liquid water at zero degrees or 270 degrees Kelvin. Because if there was any salt or any solution occurred, uh, it, the temperature at which it stopped would be different. The temperature at which it melted would be different. We found rocks on Mars that had green patches on them. I published a paper saying there are green patches. And this was ridiculed because NASA said Mars was all orange red. Well, it was several years later that a NASA employee published a paper saying that he had found green patches on Mars. And um, Curiosity has sent down hundreds of pictures showing green patches on soil and rock on Mars. I found one green patch that looked to me like lichen. And for years, people have presumed that if there is any life on Mars, it would be lichen. Lichen are the pioneers of vegetation when Circe exploded and came up out of the ocean. The first thing that appeared on it when it cooled down were lichen. So I 
got a piece of lichen on a rock in Virginia, and I took it to JPL, and they put it through the JPL imaging system, just like they did the green patch image that they found on Mars. They explored six channels of frequency. All six on Mars and Earth were identical. There was also a report of chlorophyll on the lander itself, that dust had blown up on the lander carrying chlorophyll, something alive. The paper got published in a reputable journal and somebody had it withdrawn. Uh, I know who, but I don't want to say, but it was a perfectly legitimate paper and should not have been withdrawn. Chlorophyll was most likely detected. Someone in Hungary found dark dune spots, which they thought were biomarkers on Mars. I already said kerogen was reported. That's a dead ringer. If there is kerogen, there was life. Doesn't mean there's life now, which is interesting because NASA has spent billions of dollars and many flights not going back to see if what Viking found was alive, but to look for evidence of dead, for evidence of past habitats that might have supported life. That's always puzzled me greatly. Now, there is an excess in the Martian atmosphere of C12 over C, I'm sorry, of C14 over C12 in the atmosphere. And living organisms, uh, unicellular uh, organisms, prefer C12 to C13 or C14. And it's because the C12 is lighter and therefore with the same energy impacted from the atmosphere, it's moving faster and hits the living microorganism more frequently and is absorbed more. You would think that the CO2 in Mars, which is 95% of the atmosphere, would long ago have been destroyed by the ultraviolet light and been converted to carbon monoxide. But it's 95% of the atmosphere. So somehow it's being regenerated from the CO. Therefore, it could be biological replenishment like occurs on Earth. Also, there have been claims made for the detection of formaldehyde and ammonia in the Martian atmosphere, two gases frequently associated with biology. A man I know uh, conducted a circadian rhythm study. You know, we all have, every living organism, including us, has circadian rhythm. It picks along at a certain rate. And he went to see whether whatever it is we found on Mars could show that kind of rate. To do that, he looked at the the production of the radioactive trace from our experiments on Mars, and he examined them, and he claimed they showed uh, the activity typical of circadian rhythm. Then another person, uh, excellent statistician, did a completely independent complexity analysis of the positive LR signature and found it was biological in nature. The controls were not. He became quite convinced that this was strong evidence. Uh, Curiosity has pitched down thousands of images. One of them looked like a worm. 
and it looked like a metazoan that's above more complex than a primitive single-celled microorganism. Within a short period of that picture coming down, NASA sent the uh, rover over and ground it up and destroyed it. But a picture was taken first. So there is a picture showing this thing that looks like a worm. I'll show it to you later and how they destroyed it. Now, all elements needed for life have been found on Mars, including stuffs, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. There have been many reports of biofossils and many meteorites, not only meteorites from Mars, but meteorites from all over the cosmos. So it makes it seem likely that panspermia is a good theory and it does happen and life gets spread all over the universe, at least our universe. Now, no Martian mission has ever found any single factor inimical even to terrestrial life, let alone to life as it might have evolved on Mars. Never a single factor precluding the possibility of life. In the 45 years since Viking returned its positive, more than 40 theories and experiments have been put out by various people to explain away the Viking results as not being biological. None of them has survived. Some scientist or other has found a fault with every one of them. So we have all this time with nothing that really competes with a biological explanation. Here are images I took from uh, the Viking lander that were sent down, but these are two years apart. There are three Martian years. Here's where I first saw green spots in this image. Now, if you look at that, you can see the green spots changing shape and position. Now, I can't say green is life. I wouldn't go that far, but it sure is suggestive. So uh, I call that a suggestive. You gotta scroll this with your two fingers. The other way. There you go. Okay. Here. Yeah, next one down. Here are other metazoans. These are images sent down. Uh, I'm sorry, these are images in a meteorite found in Sri Lanka. These are electron microscope slides of these. And the experts with those things point out that these are fossils of once living organisms. And they are metazoans, not simple single celled microorganisms. Here is that worm that uh, NASA found up here. Here it is in large. You see the crenulations. This is an artist's opinion of what it could have looked like. But that looks mighty convincing. And this is what NASA did to it. Ground it up to dust. Still, you can see some segments here. Now, what is the evidence against the possibility of life on Mars? None. There is not a single piece of evidence against the possibility of life on Mars. And of course, I claim there is hard evidence. Now, considering all of the above and the possibility of panspermia and the definite 
transmission of rocks between Mars and Earth. It would take a miracle for Mars to be sterile. You remember Carl Sagan, who at one, once believed in an image I took that was life, but retracted. He then said it was only 10% possible. But I am convinced that any jury that would listen to this story would find in favor of life. But I have not been able to get NASA to convene such a jury. The data have not been studied since 1976 when a panel from the National Science Foundation reviewed it. Since then, none. Now, I've proposed a simple variation of the LR instrument that would settle the issue in the mind of anyone I've ever talked to. I call it the chiral label release experiment. And what it does, it separately applies the carbon labeled compounds that were on Viking to separate Martian soil samples. And it separates the left-handed and right-handed versions of the two uh, chemicals that have left-handed and right-handed versions and adds other chemicals that have left-handed and right-handed versions and applies only one chemical to one soil sample. Now, if let us say the alanine got a positive response in its left-handed version, but not in the right-handed version, that's life because chemistry responds equally to the left-handed and right-handed version of isometric molecules. Now, it could be even more interesting than that. Suppose the left-handed version responds to the soil, but not the right-handed. That proves it's life. But suppose the right-handed responds but not the left-handed, that proves it's not only life, but it's life that's different from ours. That would be the most astounding finding of all, and it would have been very cheap to find that out because the instrument I finally designed only weighs about a kilogram. Could easily have been piggybacked on any one of the lander missions. So I conclude with the words of the greatest detective on earth, the great Sherlock. How often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And I invite you to look at my website, gilbertlevin.com, where all of the things I said are backed up with published articles. So I've made a case. I hope I've even changed the mind of the first speaker that was talking when I came here, or at least put some doubt in his mind. So with that, I say, good night, Pat, and I'll take any questions. All right, yes, time for questions. I have a question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this Parton, uh, Dr. Levine, um, who invited you. Um, these experiments on la these labeled release experiments. Yes. Have been replicated in many types of soil on Earth. If what? Have these experiments have been tested using various types of soil from the earth. Oh, yes, I right? told you more than yeah. 4,000 times. Yes. Did you do a similar test using an artificially created soil that would replicate Martian soil, including the um, typically half to 1% perchlorate compounds? 
we did when that, when JPL made simulated Martian soil, they didn't know about the perchlorates. So when the perchlorates were found, NASA immediately said, oh, that's what caused the response and they would release. We calculated there weren't enough perchlorates to do anything like we got. And then NASA came out surprisingly and said, hey, you know, we found many species that make their living off of perchlorates. So it's no longer any evidence for or against life on Mars. Dr. Levin? Yes. Uh, why do you think NASA is uh, disputing or, or talking down this the way they have? For 43 years, I searched my brain on that. I finally reached what I think may only be the conclusion. I'm not a spiritualist. I don't believe it's religion. I don't believe it's spooky. I think it's simple. NASA is very desirous of sending men to Mars. And if there are microorganisms on Mars, they could be pathogenic to man. So if you send astronauts, you're going to have to say they're expended, or if you bring them back, you're hazarding the whole world to something unknown, and we know it's impossible to contain a specimen. We've never been able to do it. When the astronauts landed, they popped open their capsule, and the dust escaped immediately. When they landed, the uh, missiles from outer space when they went off to collect samples to see how high life was. It crashed, I think, in Michigan supposed to come down, but it split open and the sample came out. Then NASA fears that this will set back the manned mission to Mars indefinitely. If we pertain the possibilities that there could be pathogens that would affect the men on Mars, it could be brought back to Earth. Now, I have a problem with that. And it is, can any government employee or organization keep a secret for 45 years? I can't imagine it, but it's the only reasonable explanation I have. Uh, would, so, would everybody please mute themselves if they're not talking? Because we're all getting a lot of feedback here. Gary Ross is doing it, so is Shitlowski. Mute yourself, please. Thank you. So we can hear what uh, Dr. Levin has. What? Other people were talking. It was hard to hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. But do it again. No, what? You were supposed to talk. What? What do you want me to repeat? Why is NASA oh, against it? I'll make it shorter. I think NASA has. I think they know. Nobody with all these facts at their hands could doubt there's life on Mars. Now, I think the reason NASA doesn't want it known. Is be, it would adversely affect the Man to Mars program. There are not the public is not going to send astronauts to a planet where they may be infected with pathogens, and they're not going to let the astronauts come back to Earth when they may return. It's my opinion those samples Curiosity is taking are never going to come back to Earth. NASA funded me in 1965 to do a study on return samples. My recommendation was take the samples to a laboratory on the moon or one in orbit and study it there. Don't bring them back to Earth. I think you hit it right on the head there, Dr. Levin. You're absolutely right. I believe that NASA is blocking it, and I believe you're right. Thank you. Dr. Levin, this is the curmudgeon here. I never said that Mars exploration was not worth doing. I simply opine that the United States should stand down, and there are other partners in space exploration who are who have equal capabilities. Let them do it. Okay, but wouldn't it have been simplest and more scientific to, after 
Viking send another mission up to test what Viking found. That's how science is done. You get a positive result, you test it. Is it true or not true? If it is, you go a little further, like we intended to do with the chiral label release experiment. Uh, I'm not disputing you. I agree. I'm looking at the larger policy picture. I can't hear. He's looking at the larger policy picture uh, rather than to confirm life on Mars. It's to do what? The larger policy picture. Oh, what what do you mean by that? With this medium, you can't really talk. There couldn't be anything more important than detecting life on Mars. We've been answering that ancient question. I think that there's a design there. I really believe you're right. I think that 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 they're avoiding it because they want to send humans to Mars. And I think it's perhaps the biggest mistake they're going to make. I think that no. they need, I think they need to put it into robotics, put all the money into that. And that's what they need to do as far as exploring these countries. And I've been saying that all along. Robotics agree. do a better job than humans. Way better. And it wouldn't cost as much. That's right. the whole point. Right. For, you want to do it for economics. Mars, if you bring samples back from Mars, it takes at least six months to get back. Samples cooped up in a test tube for six months, and we don't know what their environment is supposed to be, they're going to come back dead. Or it could be like COVID. I think that there'll be a lot of people in the club, though, that will disagree with you on that because they want to send people to out to space. And I, I and again, I've been arguing that point for years, and uh, and and you've given me some more fuel. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Are we done? If we don't have any more questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Incidentally, I thought your club sounded very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. We uh, we pride ourselves in being an interesting gang. Oh, very good. Okay. Thank you, Dale. Thank all of you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Doctor. Excellent presentation. Thank, Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate it a lot. Thank you very much. Bye bye. All right, everybody. I regret to say that we can't uh, all have dinner together like we used to at the Red Coat, but we'll be seeing you all in a couple of weeks. At Macomb's virtual meeting and do keep in mind the link is embedded in the MailChimp email. You don't have to email join live at warrenaskin.org as long as you're getting that email. So it's in big text. Click to join the WebEx. So when you see that come through from Macomb, click the big blue link and you'll be able to get into the meeting automatically. Just uh, just as a point of fact, though, uh, the first email did not have the link to the WebEx. The second one did. Yeah, so, but we'll so we'll go going forward. To, we'll try to include it in the future. Yeah, we will going forward. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night. Night. Thank good night. you. Bye. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. 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 bye.